Okay, so I guess we can start. So good morning, everybody, and welcome to day two of um, Africa Week 2020-21. Um, the theme this year is A Resilient Africa, and um, this morning we are having a keynote address with um, Professor P. L. O. Lumumba, and we are so grateful to have him speak with us to speak to us today. Um, my name is Alice Odami, and I will be the moderator for this morning's keynote. So, just a little bit about me: I am a Waterford alumni. I graduated in 2017. I am actually um, also an alumni, I guess I could say, of um, the UWC Africa Week um, leadership team. So, I'm so happy that I've been reinvited to be a part of Africa Week. Um, I am currently a senior at Luther College studying economics, international studies, and French. Um, I graduate next year. And yeah, so that's a bit about me. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Ms. Patricia. Thank you so much, Alice. This is such an amazing moment for me um, in my career to be in the same room as Professor Lamumba. I have followed um, his father, uh, as a, a young girl like you, Alice. And, um, you know, Professor Lamumba is joining us from Mombasa. And, you know, when, when you think of the trajectory of the last century, um, the 20th century in our continent, it was such an amazing, um, vibrant time for all of us um, and in the diaspora. Um, I was born in Guyana, um, quite a long way away from um, the kingdom of Iswatini, and I'm not sure um, as a young girl whether I actually knew about Iswatini. Of course, South Africa and Southern Africa was very much in our minds um, at the time that I was growing up in, in the 50s and 60s. And so, you know, it was a time of hope and um, and fervor and, and resilience and, and lucha and fighting and, and being part of um, a political life. Your whole life was um, around politics. My father, um, as a gr growing up as a child, um, eavesdropping on the conversations of, of my elders. And of course, as a, a young woman being part of the black women's um, resistance movement in, in London, and um, the organization of women of African and Asian descent. And so, you know, the, the name Lumumba was very much um, part of our day-to-day our -day lives. Um, in fact, I had said, if I ever had a boy, I would call him Patrice. And um, in fact, I had a girl and her name is Mandela. And so um, you can Im imagine, um, Alice, how I feel now to be with uh, Professor Lumumba at this moment. So I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to hand um, over Professor Lumumba to you and I'm going to sit back and just enjoy the next few moments of, um, of, of this momentous occasion actually for, for me um, at this time of my life. So thank you very much Professor for, for joining us here in um, Eswatini and at Waterford Kamhlawa. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for that introduction and for giving me the opportunity to share my thoughts on a subject uh, that is ever topical, Africa's resilience. Just uh, this morning, I was uh, rereading a book which I commend to all of you. The book written by Senegal's Chekanta Diop barbarism and civilization or civilization and barbarism and 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 what Sheikh Ante Diop does in that very epic book is to look at the history of Africa the history of Africa is one of glamour if one goes to the long period before the advent of uh, slavery and uh, the advent of colonization and the advent of the neo-colonial project. And Chekante Diop, who is undoubtedly the greatest writer and thinker of pre-independence Africa, in a series of books tells us of the great civilizations that existed in the continent of Africa. Indeed, in any part of Africa, 
If you go outside of the pyramids of Egypt and go into the empire of Benin, the Ashanti Empire, the Dogon, who were familiar with astronom astronomy very early on, you go to the Monomotapa Empire in Central Africa and look at the many civilizations that existed and that were disrupted. The story is told, of course, in a romanticized fashion of Mansa Musa, whose uh, journey to Mecca destabilized the economy of the Arab world, surely, merely because of the gold that he had carried along with him. But that, as we know, and as is recorded, was disrupted by the project of slavery. And it is always important to note that before slavery was introduced in its full splendor by the European powers, there had been trade that was going on in the western part of Africa for a very long time, involving the Temne, the Mende, the Malinke, the Wolof, and many other African nations with the Portuguese principally and subsequently the Spaniards and other European powers. It is also on record that on the eastern coast of Africa, there is evidence that Africans were trading with the Arabs and even with the Chinese. And there is a lot of archaeological work that confirms this, as well as anthropological writings that confirm all these. But we know that these European powers in a very diabolical way then started engaging in slavery. And this happened when they went into what they then called the new lands, the Americans and the Caribbeans. And at that time, as all of us know, Europe was very agrarian and the African was then seen as a commodity to be used in their farms, in the sugar plantations, in the Caribbean islands, in Brazil, and what is now known as the United States of America. Not to say that slavery has completely disappeared, but slavery in the form in which I'm talking about, of course, was then subsequently abolished. But as you know, the abolition of slavery was not particularly or exclusively informed by uh, the benevolence of the slave master. There is a sense in which an industrializing Europe and the advent of industrialization made slavery to be completely untenable. And even as we sing the praises of the abolitionists, we must always remember that is the economic value of slavery is that it did lose its luster. And even as we went into the era of the freeing of the slaves, assuming that they were freed at all, and there is no shortage of writing that one can read how the plight of the slave did not uh, improve very markedly, whether it was in the Caribbeans, in countries such as Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Antigua and Barbuda, uh, Brazil, and the entire Latin America, and in the United States of America. So that even in 1863, when Abraham Lincoln abolishes slavery or declares emancipation of the black enslaved persons, you know that it leads into a civil war. But no sooner had slavery been abolished in that grand sense, than a new scheme came into the continent of Africa. And many of you, courtesy of history, will be familiar with the activities that took place in 1884 to 1885, the month of February, in Berlin, Germany. The European powers having discovered that Africa was the repository of numerous natural resources went out of their way to enter into a most diabolical scheme to petition the continent of Africa. And the petitioning of Africa was informed by the realization that if they continued to fight amongst themselves, then they would not derive maximum benefit from the continent. And therefore, and once again, history bears us out in this regard, 
the continent of Africa was partitioned amongst the powers of Europe at that time. The French, the British, the Germans, the Belgians, the Portuguese, the Italians, and the British. And this particular scheme of colonization is one that was designed to ensure that the resources of Africa were actually taken out of the continent. And it's always instructive to look at the colonization of Africa from the different philosophies. The French were very clear in their many colonies in the continent of Africa that their agenda was to ensure that colonized persons were made French the entire philosophy of assimilation was designed in that way. The British, on the other hand, engaged in what was philosophically described as indirect rule. What they did was to identify different elders or different systems of governance which already existed in the continent of Africa and use those through a chieftaincy system where the locals were acting at the behest of the colonial administration. It is also important to note that in the case of the British, it all started as the activities of individual enterprises. And ultimately the British administration came in to provide a legal environment, which of course they did undergird the entire administration in the colonial arena. Portugal on its part was a backwater European country which herself did not have the economic wherewithal to do what the British, to do what the British were doing or to do what the French were doing. And of course they did have their spheres of influence, and we know that in Angola, in Cabo Verde, in Mozambique, and in different parts of the continent of Africa, such as Guinea-Bissau. And of course, the Germans also had their say, and the Italians their say. In a nutshell, one is saying that the colonial project was at once designed to exploit the continent of Africa and to humiliate the African. And once again, we know through the activities of Africans, not only within the continent of Africa, but outside of the continent of Africa. And many of you will have the occasion to read the activities of individuals outside of the continent of Africa, such as W.E.B. Du Bois. We'll also read the works of people like Marcus Garvey, Williams of Trinidad and Tobago and very many other Africans in islands such as Guyana and Martinique, culminating in the many conferences that were held to reclaim independence. The most emblematic of those conferences was the conference in 1945, which saw the assembly of quite a number of African leaders at that time who are involved in the struggle for independence. Of course, there were many representations from outside of the continent, particularly from the Caribbean, but there were African leaders who are engaged in the struggle for independence markedly at that time. Namdi Azikiwe of Nigeria was present in 1945 in Manchester, as was Kwame Nkrumah and as was uh, uh, Jomo Kenyatta of Kenya and Obafemi Awolowo, I think, was also present at that meeting. And the clarion call of that meeting was that we've got to get rid of the colonial project because we cannot live in a country where individuals are treated as subhuman in their own countries. It is instructive at that time that some of these colonial powers that were holding sway in the continent of Africa had also been defeated during the World War in 1945. And a new power was emerging, the United States of America. And in that context, you must see the meeting of the League of Nations in 1945 in San Francisco in the United States of America 
and subsequently in Paris, France, the declaration, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, in which the rights of colonized peoples were beginning to gain prominence. But there was also at the same time agitation at different levels. And this agitation did not start in 1948. You will see, for example, in South Africa, that the struggle to regain independence had started as early as 1912, when the African National Congress was established. But a little earlier in 1906, and I always urge young Africans to read the famous speech that was delivered by Pixley Kaisa Kaseme in the year 1906, when he was a student at the University of Columbia, the title of the speech was The Regeneration of Africa. And riding on the crest of that agitation, it is noteworthy that Pixley Kaisa Kaseme was one of the founding fathers of the African National Congress. And I'm saying this to demonstrate that Africans had always resisted the attempt at colonization. In Kenya, you will see the activities of individuals such as Harithuku in 1922. And you go to different parts of Africa, you see that there was always that agitation. But that is perhaps too much history to engage in at this stage. Suffice it to say that after the World War II, there was a movement toward decolonization. And that is also, it is also important to note that even prior to that, as early as the 19th century, the United States of America had established what was essentially a colony in Liberia, which was being run by free slaves. It is also important to note that at that time, the Ethiopians had defeated the Italians at the Battle of Adua. And this was indeed iconic and emblematic at once, demonstrating that Africans were resisting foreign powers which were coming to exploit and to humiliate her sons and daughters. But as I've said a little earlier, we normally focus more on the broader struggle for independence, which is deemed to have been marked on the ground when Ghana regained her independence in 1957. And when Ghana regained her independence in 1957, it is always important to remember these very significant words of the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah when he said that the independence of Ghana meant nothing as long as the rest of Africa was not independent. And you see the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah immediately one year after Ghana regains her independence convenes a meeting in Accra, Ghana in 1948 to begin to tell Africans that there is a duty for Africans to move as one force in the struggle to decolonize the entire continent. And soon after the meeting in 1958, he holds or convened jointly with King Hassan of Morocco, another meeting in Casablanca, Morocco. But that is a very important period in the history of Africa, particularly when we talk about our, our resilience because the colonial powers have now realized that they are going to lose their colonies. And what they are doing now is to use subterfuge to recruit a few Africans as fifth columnists to be used to undermine the gains that have been realized through the emerging independence movement so that while Kwame Nkrumah is holding a meeting in Casablanca, Morocco, and he is supported in that regard by Ahmed Ben Bella of, Live, of, of, uh, of Algeria and Modibo Keita of what was then known as the French Sudan or now known as Mali, they form what is now known as what was then referred to as the Casablanca group. The Casablanca group is the group that believes that Africans must regain total independence. But at the same time, another group has also emerged. And one of the major promoters of this group is the then uh, president of France, who was a military general and has been recalled from uh, 
from retirement, Charles de Gaulle. And Charles de Gaulle, of course, then recruits a group of Africans led by Côte d'Ivoire's Félix Houffé Boigny and William Tubman, who have their meetings in Monrovia, and that is known as the Monrovia Group. Those two groups are very important when we talk about the entire subject of Africa's resilience. So that in 1963, because after that, you and me know that a number of countries then get received, they regain their independence. There is an explosion of the granting of independence of the surrender of the colonial powers in the 1960s. The Democratic Republic of Congo, we know, of course, regains our independence in 1961 with Patrice Emery Lumumba as the Prime Minister and Joseph Kasavubu as the President. We know that uh, in, uh, Nigeria regains our independence with Namdi Aziki as the President and Abu Bakr Tafawa Balewa as the Prime Minister. We know that in 1962, Tanzania, Tanganyika, regains our independence with Mwalimu Julius Kambarage Nyerere, Uganda with Apollo Milton Obote, Mali with Modibo Keita, Guinea with uh, Ahmed Seko Touré, Algeria with Ahmed Ben Bella, and of course Zambia a little later with Kenneth uh, David Kaunda. So that there is a move of independence in Africa. So when they meet therefore in 1963, between the dates of 23rd through to 25th in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, under the patronage of Hale Selassie. There are two movements that are on the trail, as it were. There is the Casablanca group, whose chief high priest, if you allow me a little hyperbole, is Kwame Nkrumah. Then there is another group, the Monrovia group, whose chief high priest, if you may, is Felix Soufé Boigny of La Côte d'Ivoire. Kwame Nukuruma is very clear on that day, and I urge every other young African to read one of the most iconic speeches ever delivered by an African, the speech of Kwame Nukuruma on the 25th day of May, 1963. Kwame tells his audience on that day, that we must leave Addis Ababa with a united Africa. We must come out of here with a unite with one army. We must come out of here with one cabinet. We must come out of here with one currency. And I'm urging you who are present here, let us put together a council of ministers to fine tune all these things. Let us even choose the headquarters of the United States of Africa on his, on my part, the Osagi for says, I propose that it should be in Bangui in the Central African Republic or in Leopoldville in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Leopoldville is now known as Kinshasa because of their centrality. He's saying these things and he reminds his audience, if we allow ourselves to leave this place without unity, then the imperialists under the guise of investment or different guises will come back again. And divided as we are, we are going to be manipulated and the neo-colonial project is going to gain root. The Osagie for speaks eloquently, passionately, and with a sense of urgency. But is contradicted by the Monrovia group. The Monrovia group says, Yes, we want to unite, but we can only unite on the basis of an incremental process. Let us move slowly and in the fullness of time we are going to unite. And that heralds the birth of the organization of African unity, which is a thoroughly watered down version of what the Osagie for Kwame Nkrumah had contemplated as being critical to gluing the continent of Africa together. The net effect is that Africa then proceeds from that day as disunited. But it's important perhaps to retrace our steps that no sooner had the colonial project been defeated than, a, than another project was instituted in a very clever way. 
and that project was instituted by the recruitment of Africans in specific countries to ensure that those who are pan-Africanist, those who are visionary, were undermined and or eliminated. And you see the first of those acts are the assassination of Patrice Emery Lumumba in the Congo. Subsequently, we see the assassination of Silvanus Olympio in 1963 in Togo. And after that, we see a series of coup d'etats. Ahmed Ben Bella is removed in Algeria. Uh, Modibo Keita is removed in Mali. There is an attempt to remove uh, Ahmed Seko Touré in Guinea. Of course, the Osagi of Kwame Nukuruma himself is removed in 1966. The administration of Nambia Zikwe is removed uh, in Nigeria and Abubakar Kartafawa Balewa is assassinated as is Ahmad Dubelo, the Sodaner of Sokoto, leading politicians in Nigeria. And we also see mutinies across the continent. You see these mutinies in Kenya, mutinies in, uh, in Tanganyika, mutinies in Uganda. All these are clearly and carefully choreographed by the hidden hand of the colonial powers. But Africa refuses to surrender. And I think this is what legitimizes the discussion that you have invited me to engage in, the resilience of Africa. That Africa finds herself in a situation where she is constantly bombarded by the diabolical machinations of foreign powers, but she refuses to succumb. There is a sense in which she never says die, if you may. But one should not run away, run away from oneself in recognizing that although we have all these countries which have regained their independence, there are certain remnants within the African continent which remain like an albatross upon the neck of the continent of Africa. Countries regain independence, many of them, there were 32 of them in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, but yet they are countries which are under the colonial tutelage of the Portuguese, which are not independent and do not gain, regain their independence until late in the, in the late 1970s or early 1980s. These are Angola, Mozambique, Cabo Verde, Guinea-Bissau. And you can see from those countries, there are people who have been fighting at all times. In Guinea-Bissau, you will remember the fights of, led by Amilka Cabral in, uh, in Mozambique, Eduardo Monlane and Samora Moises Marshall. In Angola, Agostino Neto, Jonas Malheiro Savimbi and Holden Roberto. And all these are individuals who are fighting against a Portuguese and a Portugal government which is desperate to retain her colonies. This happens when I am alive and well, and I, could, I saw the negotiations that were taking place in Nairobi, Kenya, or in Dar es Salaam, and, and, and in other parts, or in, uh, in, in Zambia, in Lusaka, under the tutelage of, of Kaunda, or in Dar es Salaam under uh, Nyerere and in Nairobi under uh, Kenyatta at that time. And apart from those two, three or four remnants that I've talked about from Portugal, there is also the apartheid regime. Those of you who are close to South Africa will remember what had happened at that time that when Henrik Farfoot and the Nationalist Party instituted the apartheid regime in 1948, and South Africa only regains our independence effectively in 1994. And we also remember the, what was then referred to as the Southwest African Republic, which is now Namibia. So all these things are happening at a time when we think that we are independent, but there are always remnants of countries that are not independent. And these things that I'm narrating to you are able to demonstrate to us how resilient Africa 
has remained even in the face of sustained onslaught, some of it very subtle, some of it not so subtle. It is instructive, therefore, that even at the time of regaining independence, a country such as France ensures that she signs a pact with her former colonies, which effectively has been referred to as the pact for the continuation of colonization, the essence of which that the French continue to control the economies of our former colonies and continues to print their currency, the CFA franc, and they continue to operate under the aegis of an organization which is effectively run by the French. We also note that in, Bel in the Democratic Republic of Congo, the Belgians continue to operate in an environment that allows them to manipulate activities in Congo and they participate in almost every other in destabilizing act that has seen the Democratic Republic of Congo remain unstable up till now. The British on their part, a little cleverer, a little more diabolical in my view, continue under the aegis of an organization called the Commonwealth of Nations, which is meant to be a Commonwealth of Independent State, but somehow must have a British monarch as its head. That is the state of Africa, a continent that uh, political commentators still refer to Francophone, Anglophone, Lusophone, but she remains alive and well. But that notwithstanding, she has suffered in many ways. There, there is a sense in which all these things that I've talked about, slavery, colonization, and neocolonization have undermined and continue to undermine the continent of Africa with the consequence that she continues to punch below her economic weight, below her political weight, and in many ways does not realize her potential, a population of nearly 1.4 billion, a GDP of, of nearly of 3 trillion, 1 billion people with a GDP that is smaller than the GDP of Germany or smaller than the GDP of the state of California in the United States. There is a problem there. And in the recent past, we also see in the 1960s when the world has now changed dramatically and there is an ideological war between the former Soviet Union and the United States of America, Africa once, once again becomes a theater of war. And that theater continues with the manipulation and sustenance of despotic African regimes as long as they are beholden to the United States of America or beholden to Moscow, the Soviet Union. And we see many African countries being destabilized and many African resources being taken away. And once again, Africans refuse to succumb. When the Soviet Union collapses, of course, we know that the United States of America and other uh, satellite countries which are operating under Aegis mostly the countries from the West, impose on Africa systems of governance, which as we know, have also been breeding ground for conflict in the continent of Africa. And now we begin to see yet another power emerging, and that power is China. In the last 10 years, we have seen how China through very aggressive, but very silent diplomacy, which is multi-pronged, is now entering into different parts of Africa through infra infrastructure projects, through loans and other things, all of which are designed to do what other civilizations have always done against the continent of Africa. But how has Africa responded to these? There is a sense in which in the early days, in the 1960s, Africa was blessed with men and women who had vision, men and women who had passion, men and women who were pan-Africanists. And you only have to listen to them and some of the ideas and see how relevant those ideas remain today to see how poor we have become since the departure of Kwame Nkrumah, to see how poor we have become since the departure of Mwalimu Kambarage Nyerere, see how poor 
we have become since the departure of Patrice Emery Lumumba, Modibo Keita, Amilka Cabral, Samora Moises Marshall, whom I've already mentioned, Kenneth David Kaunda, Nelson Mandela, and Agostino Nato, Ahmed Ben Bella, and many of them, that crop of leaders disappeared from the face of Africa. And I think because of that, the vision that was present and pregnant with hope in the early 1960s was torpedoed. And we have had a crop of leaders, and I use the word leaders very loosely because many of them are not leaders in the classical sense. And my own view is that we have a problem there simply because the continent of Africa is now presided over by men and women whose agenda is to occupy public office without the interest of the continent at heart. And that is why when we talk about the resilience of Africa, although we see signs of the recognition that Africa must go back to the original agenda, to the original vision, it requires great vigilance. Why do I say this? I remember in the year 2013, and this is subject to your confirmation, when Kosazana Lamini Zuma was the head of the African Union and we came up with Africa Agenda 2063. It was clearly stated under Africa Agenda 2063 that our duty and agenda as a continent was to ensure that the vision of the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma and other founding fathers was given its pride of place. That is the vision under which we are operating now. But even now, one does not see the commitment that is desirable in order to ensure that that agenda is realized. Early this year, under the spirit of Africa Agenda 2063, we saw the implementation of the Secretariat of the Africa Continental Trade Area whose purpose is to ensure that we break out, we, we break down tariff and non-tariff barriers to ensure that there is free movement of labor, to ensure that our men and women are capable of operating in an Africa that is united. But you and me know that that is something that is good on paper, but the jury is still out as to how effective it will be. But the message that we must conclude with is the message which tells us that this continent, this continent which has been humiliated through slavery, this continent which has been humiliated through colonization, this continent which has been humiliated and continues to be humiliated through the neo-colonial project, this continent which has been humiliated by our own sons and daughters, particularly sons who are egotistical and megalomaniacal, still continues to thrive. And when I look at this continent, the problem that we are suffering from, including COVID-19, which is now ravaging the continent and making us to go into the world with begging bowels, asking for vaccines and other things, I believe that this continent, particularly if it rides on the shoulders of our young men and women, will overcome this. And that sooner rather than later, the resilience of Africa will not be narrated only as if it were merely sentimental or philosophical or merely romantic, but it will be a realization that the continent of Africa indeed does have the requisite wherewithal to carry her weight politically, socially, and economically. I have no doubt that it shall happen. It may not happen in your lifetime or in my lifetime, but it will happen and it is our duty as a people of this continent to ensure that we play our part to ensure that this is realized. That is all I wish to share with you as a son of this great continent. Let us remember these famous words of the Osagie for Kwame Nukuruma. If Africa does not unite, then she will continue to be exploited by the imperialists the imperialism, imperialism does not change its DNA. It wears different masks, but it remains the same. And as Diosagye for said, let us not look east or west. Let us look forward in the knowledge that we are not children of a lesser God.
Thank you. Thank you, Professor Lumumba, for your powerful and thoughtful insights on the resilience of Africa. I know you have an engagement in a few minutes, so I'm just wondering if you still have enough time for questions. Yes, indeed. I'll take a few questions. Okay, so the first question, so you've spoken a lot about Pan-Africanism and um, a united Africa and Kwame Nkrumah's vision for united Africa, but in the face of xenophobia, ethnic cleansing, religious tensions throughout Africa, we've seen xenophobia happen in Southern Africa, religious tensions in East and West, is a united Africa and, and the vision of Kwame Nkrumah, are those still attainable goals? Yes, those are attainable. Sometimes when we talk about the problems of Africa, we assume that these problems are unique to Africa. Indeed, I dare say that every civilization has have had their problems and continue to have their problems. This Europe that we continue to talk about was the first world war, not essentially a tribal war of European tribes, was the so-called second world war, not a tribal war. During my own lifetime, when the Soviet Union broke up, broke up into different spaces, was that not in Europe? When Yugoslavia broke up, was it not in Europe? When Czechoslovakia separated to create the Czech Republic and Slovakia was not, not that not in Europe? As I speak now, there is a war going on between Azerbaijan and uh, Armenia. Is that not in Europe? As I speak now, is there not a war in Chechnya? Is there not a war in, uh, in Ukraine? Is there not instability in that part of the world? As I speak now, is there not war in Syria? Is there not instability in Iraq? Is there not instability in the Levant region? Don't you remember that there is a war in Afghanistan, in Pakistan? Don't you remember that until very recently there were wars in Cambodia, in Laos, in East Timor, in Vietnam? Didn't you remember in 1953, there was a war in Korea and that until now the Korean Peninsula is divided. Don't you remember that in Latin Central America, there was a war in, in uh, Nicaragua, that there is instability in Venezuela. Don't you remember that there were coup d'etats in, in uh, Brazil until 1975? Don't you remember that there were coups in Chile, in Peru, in Argentina? And in the United States of America, don't you remember that there was a civil war? Don't you remember there was the civil rights movement in 1963? Don't you remember the killing of George Floyd? Don't you remember that there is an ongoing battle? Conflict is a part of human affairs. And I believe that Africans will go through these difficulties. And this is the very reason why it is incumbent upon your generation to be the generation that takes over the baton. We may appear like, if you allow me this Christian analogy, we may appear like John the Baptist speaking in the wilderness, but these voices must remain alive and well. As the great Chinua Achebe once said, you are the young suckers that are now growing as the old bananas are dying. Pan-Africanism has a place now, perhaps even greater, it is only a few years ago, the Osage for Kwame Nkrumah died only in 1972. And that is not long ago. The dreams that he had, the dreams that Michelle had, the dreams that Nkrumah, that, that uh, Mandela had, the dreams that these great men and women had will be realized through your generation and generations yet to be born. The struggle, must continue. Thank you for that. And just on that point of um, young people having that responsibility, um, Banela and Kambule asked, growing up in an Africa where the Western political systems are viewed as the only options of governance we have in Africa, how can we as young people work towards the vision of Kwame Nkrumah to create a political Africa that has Africa's best interests at heart? A friend of mine who is a traditional ruler in Ghana and who is also a professor of political science, Nana Nkesia the fifth, says that Africa must now begin to look at systems of government that are relevant to our circumstances. When you ask a typical young African today what democracy is, they give you what I describe as Eurocentric definition. 
They tell you that democracy means multi-party. They tell you that democracy means that we must have election. Democracy means that we must have NGOs. These are Eurocentric ideas. What I believe is that democracy should mean the ability of a people to determine how they govern themselves. And it cannot be true that systems of governance will be common. There is no one size fits all. How the people of Eswatini want to govern themselves must be determined by the people of Eswatini. How the people of Kenya want to govern themselves must be determined by how the people of Kenya, as long as the people's will is expressed. And I am one who now believes that it is through self-determination of the many African nations that African unity will be realized. It is now a legitimate argument for us to ask whether the systems we inherited from other civilizations are good for us. The great philosopher Alexander Pope once said, drink deep the Pyrian spring or taste not because a little modernity is a dangerous thing. And there is a sense in which we have inherited things that we don't understand. And if you want to confirm what I'm saying, in all countries in Africa, when there is election, the country is threatened because people look at the pursuit of power as if it was a life and death issue. The time is now that we must engage in honest and candid conversations as to whether these things that were bequeathed to us by the Western powers is not a part of the scheme to ensure that we stay in a perpetual state of conflict so that we are in a perpetual state of susceptibility to manipulation. The conversation must now begin. And the fact that you have asked that question tells me that within your generation, you are beginning to wrap your minds around those issues. It begins when I, with an idea. The idea is then watered through rigorous discussion where good ideas give way to better ideas. Let the discussion begin. Thank you for that. I can think of just studying in the US, I can think of many instances in my political science classes where I'm arguing that democracy, the Western form of democracy is not the only way, but seems to be a foreign idea to many people. So thank you for your insights on that. Um, I think we'll take our last question. So this is from Facebook. So somebody says, thank you for your words, Professor Lumumba. It has been encouraging to hear about the history of Africa's resilience and resistance throughout the decades and centuries. Considering the modern day, and the turmoil we have recently seen in South Africa, Eswatini, Cabo Delgado province of Mozambique and many others. What role do you think the former freedom, fi freedom fighter parties, for example, for Limo in Mozambique and the ANC in South Africa play in building the national resilience and political stability of their respective countries? You know, what you are saying just this morning, I seldom tweet, but today I did and said, how is it that the conflict in Ethiopia is raging and I do not hear anything from the chair of AU, I do not hear anything from the chair of the Council of the AU, and yet this has been described as the decade of the silencing of the guns. And there is a sense in which you have mentioned those conflicts. There is conflict, as you said, in uh, in, in northern Mozambique, there is conflict in Tigray, there is conflict in Central Africa, there is conflict in northern uh, Burkina Faso, there is conflict in Mali, there is conflict in Cameroon, there are conflicts in different parts of Africa, and all these are attended by other humanitarian issues. And the question you ask, what can the freedom fighting movements do? Part of the problems in many countries are actually the freedom fighting movements. Some of the individuals who are freedom fighters in many of these countries believe that the country owes them. Many freedom fighting movements turned into political parties have not had a proper transition. They still think that they cannot be questioned about anything. They think that because they suffered, Therefore, the country must put up with their political bad manners. That is normally described as the martyr complex or the messiah complex. 
Many of these individuals suffer from the Messiah complex. They think their God gives to their country. And I think that there is need for them to gain internal reform if they are going to be beneficial to their countries because those who have the honor and privilege of serving their countries must always remember that they may be alive, but others paid the ultimate price with their lives. So there is need. I said at one time that Africa need three major meetings at the headquarters of the African Union. Meeting number one for one week will only ask one question. What are we doing wrong? Question number two, how can we solve our problems? And question number three, within what time must we solve all these things? The time has come for us to make resolution. The time has come for us to implement the resolution that we have made over the years. And they are many and they are good. Africa is not going to realize our potential if when I want to travel to South Africa, they want everything, including the age of my great great grandmother in a manner of speaking. We must break down these boundaries. We must break down these barriers so that the sons and daughters of Africa can move without let and hindrance. And this can only be done when you have visionary men and women and you have young men and women who are demanding. Yesterday, I saw something that is as amazing as it is unique in the streets of Accra. Young men and women were demonstrating and they broke no shop. Within their ranks, there were people who were collecting garbage. They ensured that theirs was a decent protest. That is what I expect from young Africans beginning to make demands of the men and women who are in political leadership. And ultimately, even the Himalayas will fall. Thank you, Professor Lumumba, and thank you for mentioning um, the, the way Ghanaians are protesting. As I'm from Ghana, I'm a young Ghanaian, I'm proud of the things that are happening in Ghana and across the continent. So thank you for mentioning that. And once again, thank you for joining us. We are so excited and so grateful to have you and your insights and just all your powerful thoughts this morning. We won't take too much of your time. So if you need to drop off for your next meeting, we will thank not you. <laughs> we will not be um we will not hold you accountable for that. So thank you thank again. You very much. And I wish you the very best. Continue with the spirit of never saying die. It will be well with us. We cannot fail. Yes. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, thank so you for with that, I will close off the event. So thank you everybody for attending the event. This was um, our first session of day two. Um, so for the rest of the week, um, we have two more sessions. Sorry, I just lost my place. We have two more sessions coming up. So today we have um, at 4 p.m. today, sorry, at 10 a.m. today, we have the virtual panel webinar, the, prop the propeller behind an African. And then at 4 p.m. today, we have virtual panel webinar two, which is Africa twice as tall. And then on the 7th of August tomorrow at 3.30 p.m., we will have another virtual panel webinar, which will be African Women Leadership in STEM. So please stay tuned for that. Be sure to, be sure to log in. And once again, thank you to Professor Lumumba for joining us this morning. And um, thank you to Ms. Anjuko for um, facilitating Professor Lumumba's um, presence with us. And with that, I will hand it over to Ms. Patricia if she has any closing thoughts. Gosh, closing thoughts. Um, there's so much here. I've been taking notes um, all during Professor Lumumba's uh, talk. Um, there is a weight also that we carry, as Professor Lumumba was saying, and uh, an important part that we all have to play and I think putting our egos aside, putting our own personal agendas of power aside, putting our ideas of where we in individually want to go in life above um, the um, agenda of our nations and our continent is something that we will have to relearn because when we have heard of all of those illustrious 
men and actually there are many illustrious women of the 60s and 70s who were part of the liberation movement for independence and I love the way that Professor Lumumba talked about our, um, our regaining of our independence rather than the independence movement. Um, highlights to us how we are an independent nation um, and an independent continent. And what we have gone through has led us to believe that we are now becoming independent. We are independent, we were, and we still are. I think that this idea um, that has to be, in our school anyway, um, further developed is what role do um, our young people play in the future of our, our continent and how we can ensure that that is something that the world is looking at. Um, we are looking out at the world, but the world needs to see within Africa um, that huge human resource. He talked about a figure that I think is so interesting of the 1.4 billion Africans. We only own 3 trillion in our GDP, the equivalent of Germany or the state of California. We have to do something about that. Um, we all have our, our, our place and our, our, um, our work to do here. And um, the messages are, you, you know, are huge. There's so many. Um, in that hour, Professor Lumumba has taken us through history, taken us through our own histories and histories through um, many centuries of struggle. And, you know, with some sadness, I think, um, he talks about maybe we don't see it in our lifetime and not even yours. Well, I, I, I sincerely hope it is in your lifetime, Alice, and those of the rest of the Waterford Come Flower uh, students and alumni. Um, it may not be in mine, but it certainly will have to be in yours. So um, we work together um, in this. We hold our hands together in this and we fight together um, in this across our nations. So thank you very much for all of those who were um, instrumental in organizing um, Professor Lumumba's um, participation today. Thank you, Anne, um, for making this possible for us in um, Waterford Kamplawa. And um, this is a unique lecture that we had. This is a unique moment um, in our history too um, of Waterford Kamplawa. So I thank you all for being part of this conversation and uh, we have work to do, a lot of work to do. We have a fight to fight. Thank you, Alice. I think we are making some progress as we've seen in Ghana, Nigeria, South Africa, Swaziland, the youth are, they're creating their own path and making a difference. And we here, we're sitting here discussing this. I think that means we're thinking about it. That means we're, we're about to do something. We're about to do something great. So I have hope very much so that change will happen in my in my generation. Thank you everybody again for attending. Um, please do um, attend the next events. There's a whole lot to there's a whole lot to attend um, in the next few days. So please do attend that. Thank you once again and have a good day everybody. Thank you.